Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to this next lecture in the series, uh, which is all about dark matter. Um, we, oh gosh, in the order that these are in, I uh, just talked about black holes um, uh, at the end of talking about stellar evolution. Uh, and because these videos are for a specific course and I've had to kind of pick and choose a few things um, near the end that I wanted to cover uh, because we can't cover everything in one semester. Um, there's going to be a brief, very brief introduction to galaxies right now, um, followed by a uh, discussion of dark matter. Um, so way back in the very first video, I showed this image which uh, kind of put into perspective the different, not really scales or, or of um, systems in uh, that, that we're, we're looking at. So Earth the planet, Earth is one planet in a solar system. The solar system has one star, the sun. Um, <clears throat> the sun is one of a bunch of stars in the interstellar neighborhood. And the sun is also part of this Milky Way galaxy, um, which has a hundred billion stars roughly in it. Um, we're about two thirds of the way out in this big spiral flat disk galaxy. Um, and our galaxy is just one of um, several in our local group, which is part of a supercluster, and you can go bigger and bigger out to the large scale of the universe. But let's pull back uh, to the galaxy. Um, if you've ever been at a really dark uh, night sky site, uh, you may have seen this faint glow or faint bands that goes across the sky um, called the Milky Way. Uh, <clears throat> this is a, a, a photograph stitched together from many different locations at different times um, of what the entire galaxy would look like. Um, kind of wrapped around us from the whole sky. And you I, you want to imagine this like you're on the, oh, I didn't, usually I have dirty dishes here, but I don't. <laughs> imagine a plate, like a, a dish, um, and you're looking along the side of it. Imagine you're like a little crumb on that dish. Uh, when you look through, you see just the flat um, part of that disc of that dish that's all around you. Um, and, so we are off to the side. We're not near this glowing center here. We're off about two thirds of the way out from, from the um, area we can see. But we don't uh, have any pictures of the Milky Way like this. So going back, this is um, an artist conception. A lot of times you'll see pictures of, of other galaxies that are Milky Way-like um, because the galaxy is so large, um, we have not uh, been able to send out a spacecraft to take a photo and then beam that photo back. So this is um, what we have to work with. We're studying the Milky Way from inside. Couple things, a um, couple different parts to this. Um, that flat disk is uh, stars and gas. Um, you see, you find young stars there. You see star formation happening there. Um, the in the center, there's actually like a roundish. A structure of star, more stars, more gas, um, which is called the central bulge. And in the very tiny, tiny center of that is um, a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. Sun, again, is about two thirds of the way out in this disk, um, but not everything is in this flat disk. Um, there is a halo of stars, typically older stars, but really no gas. Um, that is a spherical distribution around the Milky Way um, or around the, the disk part of the Milky Way. Um, and these red dots here are indicating globular clusters. Um, these are star clusters that are tend to be very old, very compact, um, and scattered again spherically around this disk. So um, we have an older population of stars and kind of a spherical section and then all the new stuff is really happening in the disk. What's interesting is that sitting here in the Milky Way, we can measure the velocity or the speed of the different parts of the disk. Um, we can do that for our galaxy um, by really well uh, using radio telescopes to look at the 21 centimeter 
um, line of hydrogen. Um, that is something that could be mapped with a small, small, like college level $10,000 telescope. Um, and we can also look at the rotation speeds of other spiral galaxies. Um, so this example is, is um, of another galaxy, M33, um, Messier 33, but it's similar to what you would see for the Milky Way, and it's really well done, so I picked this one. Um, and when you look at how fast things orbit around the disk of the galaxy as a function of distance from the center, um, you see something interesting. So a, a, a galaxy disk isn't a solid piece. It's not like a, the base of a merry-go-round. Um, things orbit at slightly different speeds. Where else have we seen things orbit in, at different speeds? Solar system. Remember Kepler's th third law tells us that um, if uh, the further out you go in the solar system, the lower your velocity, it's slower. Um, that is particularly because, let me skip ahead to this little gif here, um, you can see the planets orbiting in the fastest ones in the center, Mercury, Venus, and then you have Earth, and you have Mars, which is slower, and obviously a lot more beyond that. Um, what you get when you make a plot of distance from the sun, distance from the center, and velocity, is you get this, this drop down, right? It's gonna be highest in the middle and drop down. Um, that's because most of the mass, like 99.99 something, some number of nines uh, percent of the mass in the solar system is in the sun. The planets are like, you know, like dust <laughs> in comparison. Galaxy though isn't so compact, right? So it's got, you know, uh, that central bulge and then, you know, we're talking about these particular galaxies that have a disk. Um, so there's not really fast rotation in the center because there's less mass there, but as you swallow up more mass of the galaxy um, inside your orbit, uh, that'll make your speed go up until you get to a point where you've got most of the mass inside your orbit and then the speeds will drop. So this part of the curve would sort of follow Kepler's law. What was discovered when um, scientists made this curve for the Milky Way and for other galaxies is it did not do that. This is showing um, for M33 um, the rotation speeds of the stars in the galaxy and uh, beyond where the stars are, there's also a disk of hydrogen gas that glows in radio, so you can get even more, um, you can get further away from the center. It, oops, it keeps going up. <laughs> it keeps going up, it doesn't go down. That means that, that there's more and more and more and more mass as you go out to these greater distances. But in the picture, we see the starlight and the gas peter out, doesn't look like there's a lot of mass there. Um, just for comparison, I also showed what a solid disk would look like, which obviously <laughs> this is not a solid disk, um, but a uh, solid disk, sort of what you get what's happening in the middle. Not that it, it's not solid. Anyway, um, so this curve here, if you imagine that this, this is a lot more mass now, um, and that would mean there's a lot more mass that we don't see and that the galaxy is bigger than we think it is. Um, that this is artist conception, again, spiral galaxy, Milky Way. Um, and this blue stuff is indicating um, all of this mass. It's actually in a spherical distribution too. It's not in a disk um, that extends way beyond the parts of the galaxy that we can see in starlight or in gas. Um, so this is what was cleverly termed dark matter because it's matter that we can't see get it <laughs> um so this this was hypothesized to to try and figure out why this curve was so so different from what was predicted um so this is an artist's conception of what it would look like for the milky way galaxy turns out if you look at a whole cluster of galaxies there's a lot of dark matter in that too. Um, this is a picture of a cluster of galaxies. Um, a lot of these ovals here, 
and these circles, the yellowish white ones, um, are galaxies in this cluster. Um, the blue shading indicates uh, where astronomers have detected mass um, using a technique I'll explain in a little bit. Um, but just take this as kind of like a model again of uh, each galaxy has its you know normal matter, its visible matter, although that means visible and radio and everything else. Um, but there's also this huge cloud of something, <laughs> some huge reservoir of mass um, that's also here. So um, if you're reading the book at Play in the Cosmos along with this, they talked about two hypotheses. Um, one hypothesis was that there are a lot of really dim objects we haven't discovered. So white dwarfs that have cooled down so that they're like, their luminosity is so low, we just haven't detected them. Neutron stars, black holes, hard to detect. Um, brown dwarfs, rogue planets, all kinds of things could be float floated out there that because they are not luminous, um, they're so hard to detect we haven't counted it. Um, and I forgot what the acronym stands for, but the acronym was MACHOS. It was uh, MACHOS. Yes, MACHOS. Um, so, okay, we have a hypothesis. We have to test it. So astronomers used a technique called gravitational microlensing. This is actually what was used to make the this image here. Um, very briefly, gravitational lensing. Uh, if you've just done the black hole chapter, particularly if you've done it in the workbook, um, you saw that uh, mass and light, even um, the path of light gets curved as it gets near a massive object. So it's not straight. Um, in fact, this is a little misleading because the space itself is curved and it's just showing space being space. Um, but anyway, the light from this background object is going out in a certain direction, but it gets curved. Awesome. It gets curved because it's attracted by the gravity of this, this galaxy. Um, so what they did for this one is uh, looked for this curvature and look all of these little arcs, <laughs> these squished arcs of our, our lensed galaxies. Um, and you can figure out where the distribution of mass is. So using this technique, for example, they figured out the distribution of mass was this huge spherical chunk. Um, they looked for tiny um, events, gravitational lensing events that would indicate that there was a white dwarf or a black hole or something, you know, going past our field of view that hasn't been accounted for. Um, and that came up short. Uh, not nearly enough microlensing events were discovered with better and better and better. Uh, telescopes and time resolution, they looked and looked and looked and did not find nearly enough of these events to account for um, the amount of dark matter that we're seeing, which uh, is about 10 times the mass of normal matter. So this is a lot. So the other main hypothesis um, in, in uh, response to machos is called WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles, that one I remember, um, saying that there's a new kind of particle it has mass, um, but it doesn't interact with light. And I don't just mean visible light. I mean, it doesn't interact with anything on the electromagnetic spectrum. It doesn't reflect light. It doesn't absorb light. It doesn't emit light. It doesn't do anything. It just doesn't even know light exists. Um, but it has mass. And so you can see its gravitational effects. Um, bizarre concept. Kind of feel like you're pulling this out of like, magic. Um, but this is this is the, the currently favored model. Um, to test that, uh, again, another use of that micro lensing technique, this is actually showing two galaxy clusters that collided and went through each other. There's a lot of space between galaxies and between stars. So when things collide, they don't actually like smash, they just kind of go through each other. Um, the galaxies went through each other, the groups of galaxies, because there's so much space. Um, there's a lot of hot gas, hot, so hot it gives off x-rays around those galaxies. That does collide. The gas from one 
and the gas from the other does collide and kind of mush in the center. That's what we're seeing in pink here. So that's the X-ray gas. Um, there's actually more mass in the X-ray emitting gas than there is in all of the little galaxies. So like galaxies are like just a tiny piece of these clusters, really. Um, so if we just had normal matter, then most of the mass of that cluster would stay in the center because it would be most of the mass would be the x-ray emitting gas the galaxies that went through each other wouldn't even you know are, are, are so much smaller so they did that gravitational lensing technique to see where is the mass concentrated and lo and behold the blue blotches are the two places where the mass are concentrated so that means there's another type of particle there or another type of mass there another type of object that doesn't act like regular gas right this regular gas collided and it's giving off x-rays and it's all clumped in the center um this these these clouds of dark matter went through each other just like the groups of galaxies went through each other this um fit this with a lot um many observations of these types of, of galaxy clusters um and a lot are consistent with this hypothesis but the particle itself hasn't been detected. Um, I don't remember last estimates that I saw. Maybe the Large Hadron Collider is big enough to detect it. I don't know. It might be too small still. Um, we just don't have the technology to, to detect this particle yet, um, which makes it really difficult to nail down into a theory, right? You, we, we infer its presence, we, we think we understand some of its properties, but unless it's actually detected, um, I wouldn't call that a theory. Um, but it is the currently, we'll say the currently accepted model of dark matter. There are, and this was very br briefly mentioned in the text, there are a small number of astronomers who are testing a third hypothesis, which is that we got new gravity wrong. New You've, we've seen this before. Newton's theory of gravity was really good until people started to find some stuff wrong with it, right? And Einstein built upon that to create, um, to come up with the, the theories of relativity. What if this effect we're seeing is because relativity doesn't explain gravity well enough? Maybe there's no invisible matter. It's just that the laws of physics are slightly different than we think. Um, Unfortunately, not those models have not held up. Um, they don't haven't been able to make um, predictions in a way that the the WIMP model has. Um, but it's not. I would say uh, there's definitely still some people working in that area. Um, but uh, for the most part, I think um, you know WIMPs, those weakly interacting massive particles that is considered um, the so-called, the so far winning hypothesis for what this dark matter is. Let's recap. Galaxies are a collection of, for little baby galaxies, maybe millions of stars. Uh, galaxies like ours, 100 billion stars. They can be even bigger to a trillions of stars. Our galaxy is a typical sized spiral galaxy. Um, measurements of the rotation of the disk of our galaxy and of other galaxies shows there's a lot more matter present in the galaxy than the matter we can see. And remember, when I say we can see, we mean with any type of light on the electromagnetic spectrum from radio to gamma ray. Um, there's evidence that this dark matter is present in most galaxies and in these large galaxy clusters. Uh, search for very dim objects failed. So the current leading hypothesis is this non-interacting particle. Um, and something to blow your mind, there's about 10 times as much dark matter in the universe as there is normal matter, the stuff that makes up people and planets and stars. Um, all right, that is it for dark matter. Uh, we'll see you next time.